Well, good evening, hello, and welcome to tonight's very special organ recital. Not given by me, you'll be very pleased to hear for the first time, but given by a really wonderfully talented um, and experienced organist, um, Richard Brazier, who's going to play Bach, he's going to play Debussy, and he's going to play two pieces by César Franck. Now, Richard, um, I'm very pleased Richard has come tonight and uh, specifically to play Franck because he's just recently released a brand new edition of his complete organ works. And if you stay to the end of the recital, after the final piece, Richard and I will actually have a chat, a Q&A, where we'll talk about various things, including uh, his new edition. I've seen it. I've had a look through it. It's a really wonderful thing. There is a link in the top of this chat. If you're very quick, i.e. tonight and tomorrow, if you buy um, the edition with the code BIS2022, you can get 15% off. It's well worth it in my view. I'm not going to say anything more tonight until the very end. Um, Richard is going to hop on in a second. And after the first piece, he will then introduce uh, the programme uh, himself. And I can guarantee that you are in for a real treat tonight. So, Richard, are you ready? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Will you please welcome to the uh, BIS organ bench tonight, Richard Brazier.
Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this evening's organ recital. It is a real pleasure to be here with you this evening. And thank you to Richard for inviting me to play. <clears throat> this evening, I'll be playing some Debussy, some Bach, and another piece of Franck. We have just heard the B minor chorale, <clears throat> one of the trois chorales that Franck composed at the very end of his life in 1890. As Richard has already said, I have been editing the organ works of César Franck. <clears throat> and as part of my research, I have been able to see some manuscripts that have not been analysed before. Three manuscripts um, that Franck was working on when he died, three versions of the Trois Chorales that Franck had intended to publish. These manuscripts were not complete and when he died, his son, Georges Franck, submitted the first complete drafts of these manuscripts to Durand, who published the Trois Chorales in 1892. And as a result, we have never really been able to play the three chorales of César Franck as Franck may have intended. And it's only now that these manuscripts have been discovered and with the publication of this edition in June, that we can now play these chorales in a way that Franck may have intended. You may have noticed some subtle differences to what we are used to hearing in this piece, but I'm sure you'll agree that the changes do improve the chorale immensely. The second piece on this evening's programme, the Arabesque No. 1 by Claude Debussy, which is commonly heard on the piano. Um, I'm going to be playing it in an arrangement by Leon Rock this evening, which will give an opportunity to explore the wonderful flutes of this Cavaillacol organ, saint Ouen in Rouen. That will be followed by J.S. Bach's emotive chorale prelude, Schmucke dich, o liebe Seele. Um, it's such an expressive piece, and of course Cavaillacol's organs are geared towards expression, and the two go together perfectly. The final piece on this evening's programme is a work that is seldom heard on organ recital programmes, the Grande Pièce Symphonique. The Grande Pièce Symphonique was the very first organ symphony, as it were, when Franck was appointed as organist at Saint-Jean Saint-François au Marais. He proclaimed that his organ was an orchestra and it is through the Grand Pièce Symphonique that we can really hear the, the merging of Cavaillacol's sound world and César Franck's harmonic idiom. And the final result is really quite spectacular. And this piece was the inspiration for Vidor's symphonies and Vierne's symphonies and many other large-scale works that appeared in the Romantic period. So thank you once again for joining us this evening. I look forward to speaking to you more at the end. And we will now continue with Debussy.
hop over onto the organ bench. Do you want your music, <coughs> Louis? You can yeah. grab it if you want, because you're probably I will, yeah, quite thank thirsty you. after all that playing. <laughs> that was um, really, really good. So thank, thank you. Thank you very much. It's a, no, thank you for playing for me. Yeah. I mean, I was very fortunate to be your only physical audience. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I know there were hundreds of people watching. Um, I think they Fantastic. Uh, look at all the applause you've got going on there. So thank Wonderful. you. Wonderful. You're all very kind. Thank you very much. What a tour de force that piece is. I, mean, I can't imagine uh, many people um, back in the 19th century when that's written mm. having ever heard <clears throat> anything like that, really. It's quite exhausting because it is relatively non stop. Yeah. There are several sections, but one has to really think about how you join those sections together. Um, and you, you don't have very much time to think. No. Um, no and, and that can be. Yeah, making really it, exhausting. Making it into a whole sort of mm. seamless symphony, isn't it? Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you very much. Let's now, so this is actually op your opportunity to um, ask any uh, questions you like. So if you want to ask uh, Richard a question, uh, please do put it in the chat. Our sort of chat uh, moderator isn't anywhere to be seen at the minute. So we might have to, <laughs> we might have to sort of wing it a little bit. Um, but I've got a few questions for him. So like I say, if you mm -hmm. want to ask Richard anything, I think particularly around César Franck, about the interpretation of uh, Franck, mm -hmm. um, he's a bit of an expert, to be honest. So um, now is your opportunity to ask. But I think before we uh, get on to um, the nitty gritty or this, the, the intelligent sort of stuff around Franck, basically, basically want to know what you thought about the experience of playing in here today, mm. playing the BIS organ and playing this sample set in here. Um, really quite extraordinary, actually. Um, it's very rare that you get to play a, a cathedral organ type console in, in your lounge um, <laughs> and it's really comfortable to play um, it's just like playing a, a proper organ actually um, which surprised me I was a bit skeptical I will admit but ah. now I've been here and tried it um, yeah. it, it mm. really is a fantastic piece of work one of the, the most amazing things about it is um, you can just change the sound you mm. can change the sample yeah and you know we're in a French um, cathedral mm. virtually today, yeah. uh, but on an English cathedral organ. So you mm. can have you know English cathedral organs playing on here, and you can have German organs, yeah. you can have any organ. It's such a wonderful yeah. thing. Um, so, but what do you think about its um, role in terms of, I mean, Havberg, I mean, um, or e even any software, mm -hmm. um, you know, in terms of um, the sample sets I've just spoken about. Its role as a practice organ in someone's house or in a, a school, uh, and as a tuition tool, do you think it has, mm -hmm. a, a, has a role in that aspect? Certainly, I think it's, it's very seldom that um, one gets to practice regularly in a, a large church or cathedral, unless you're the organist in such a place. Um, I'm not, so the opportunity to play um, an instrument that enables me to experience the acoustic of a room um, is, is really important. Um, the church where I normally practice has a relatively small acoustic, one or two seconds. Um, and the Grand Pierre Symphonique, for example, um, playing it here was the first time I played it um, on a larger organ mm. with, with the acoustic, right. acoustic properties of the room as well. So did um, you adapt your playing today as you... Yes, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, well, just the, the way you play um, the space. Mm. Mm. There are certain moments in the Grand Pierre Symphony where um, one has to use the, the acoustics of the room as part of the performance in order to join the sections together. Otherwise, it sounds very rushed. Um, and you know, there are moments this evening which were very different to how they were in my practice session. It's just how you adapt. In terms of tuition, um, very much. Um, the same. Um, students don't always get access to historic organs, um, particularly in the United Kingdom. Mm. Um, so the opportunity to play a Zilberman or a, um, a Zauer or a Steinmeier or a Kavai Kohl um, is, is a really unique thing, actually. It's almost like the next best thing mm. to having well, uh, a Kavai Kohl or a Zilberman organ um, at your disposal. Yeah. Um, so having gained so much experience as a freelance um, not a professional organist, but an international recitalist, uh, and indeed uh, someone who has taught um, outside of the UK, 
Mm -hmm. Where do you think, or what is your favourite organ? <laughs> uh, it's a bit of a loaded question, really. Um, sure, presumably it's the BIS organ now. Yes, absolutely, 100%. <laughs> um, I think the organ which really stood out, um, uh, left, left an imprint on, on me, both um, mentally and musically, um, is an organ I had the opportunity to have some lessons on when I took part in the Flentrop Scholarship um, in 2012 in Zandam. And this is the Laurenskirk in Alk Alkmaar. Mm. Mm. Um, I, I think this organ is possibly one of, if not the greatest organ on the planet for me. Um, others may think differently, of course, but just the aesthetic of the, of, of the casework, the pipework, the room, the sound, the acoustic, all of those things combined. Mm. Um, it really is quite a, a special experience. Quite an experience. Mm. It's not one that I've experienced personally, so I no. really should go and try that one out. <laughs> yes. um, and so you are the organist at the St Mary's um, German Lutheran Church mm -hmm. in, in, in London. And I was just wondering, uh, having uh, personally not being very, not familiar at all with the style of liturgy mm -hmm. and worship, and indeed the role the organ plays in the mm -hmm. liturgy uh, at St Mary's. I just wonder how different uh, music, the role of music is in the liturgy at somewhere like St Mary's, mm -hmm. as opposed to you know a, 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 a typical uh, Church of England, um, sure. Church of Cathedral. Well, like any church in the UK, it differs from church to church. Um, the, the actual structure of the mass is very much the same. Okay. Um, there are churches which have choral music as well, particularly in Germany. Um, um, in St Mary's, um, the organ plays a very prominent role. I play a prelude, I play mm. a postlude. Both are part of the service itself. So people are actively made to sit and listen to me, which is a, a real shame for them on some occasions, I'm sure. Um, and also the, the, um, the introductions to the hymns, um, the Gotteslob, are all improvised. Oh, really? um, so, mm. in, in an English parish church or cathedral, you might just play part of the hymn as the play of a, mm. uh, but in the German tradition, um, one is actively encouraged to improvise on a part of the melody, mm. um, and then you carry on with the hymn, um, and then each line, e each verse of the hymn is harmonised differently. Mm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you, don't, you don't necessarily have you just have the melody written out and then mm, you harmonise yeah. it. And it yeah. certainly challenges your harmonisation skills. Yeah, that's really good for you though, isn't it? Mm, well, really it is. Yeah. Exciting to um, word paint with harmony. Yes. You know, with the text Absolutely. And um, and to really sort of um, build up the congregation. Yeah. I mean, on, a, on an English organ, for example, let's take a, a a cathedral organ, a typical cathedral organ. You would paint the text mm. by changing stops, pressing pistons, using colour. Um, whereas in the tradition I'm, I play in, um, harmony becomes the colour mm. um, and you, you adapt the harmony to the text, mm. um, the tempo, the rhythm. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a, a sort of nuanced skill to have. I think it's a, um, one I'm still a, refining myself. A fabulous <laughs> skill to have actually mm. and that's, it's something that I yeah. would like to work on myself. Mm. Um, Right, shall we move on to um, dear César Franck now? Mm -hmm. Have sure. you got one of the books? They're, they're here. Yes. They have one of these. So I just want to just tell everyone how, how much of a, you know, um, how, um, how much I'm into quality. You know, I've recently released um, um, my own publication, um, Sheet Music, uh, uh, um, and we didn't, we basically released it to no expense spared, um, and it wasn't particularly cheap. And I, so I know what feels good. Hmm. I mean, and the, the paper in here is really fantastic paper. The, the binding is really nice. And I'm not being paid to say any of this, by the way. <laughs> um, but it's a really nice publication. There are four? There are four volumes. Four volumes, including, uh, and not including a commentary, so there are five. No, no, so volume one contains the timeline, text on performance practice, um, specifications and backgrounds of the instruments that Frank knew and played, um, a preface to all of the organ works, all mm. 21 of them from memory, um, and there's a facsimile of the Piacero Week, um, the Tropidera yeah. manuscript, mm. 
there's a catalogue of works, um, there's a, a, a very comprehensive critical commentary as well. It is very comprehensive and if you want to learn anything about Bach, uh, Bach <laughs> Franck, the other great organ composer, um, in terms of registration, it, it's really, really worth um, at least, the very least, looking at volume one where Richard mm -hmm. talks about all of, all of that um, information in great detail. So, Cesar Franck, how, how did this how did this volume come about, and um, uh, and how is it different to other editions that are currently on the market? Um, well, uh, I was asked by John Baxendale, who I believe is watching this evening. Hi, John. Um, I was asked by John Baxendale, who runs Liebird Music, um, if I would consider doing an edition of Frank's music um, in time for the bicentennial of his birth. Mm. Um, I must admit, at the <clears throat> At the very start, I wasn't all too keen on the prospect. It's quite a um, big prospect. It's quite a big, yeah. a big undertaking, but as with anything in life, if you don't uh, have a go, you'll never know. Um, so I decided to take it on. Um, and yeah, it just sort of grew and grew and grew and grew and grew, really. Um, how is it different from other editions? Um, there's some new material for a start. I, I mentioned at the beginning about the three chorales, these manuscripts which have never um, really been analysed in any great detail before. Of course they've been seen by a, a select few organists, mm. um, but the majority of these manuscripts still belong in the Franck family. Um, so in the B minor chorale, <clears throat> the, the, ch the changes there are quite important actually to the, the overall structure of the piece, and they, they make it a much stronger piece as well. There is quite a um, um, profound uh, alteration on the, I think, the third page of music mm. with a C natural. C natural, yeah. Which is has always been a C sharp. Mm. So if you go back and listen to the chorale, yeah. like onto the third page, listen out for that wrong note. It's not wrong, <laughs> it's all, but it sounds wrong, but it is very intentional. Mm. It's, it's, it's um, alterations like that which make this edition really, really fascinating to. Um, mm. To, to study. I, th I think also yeah. ed editions can be very subjective mm. um, and as, as an editor it is very very difficult to sort of stay down the middle and, and not sway too far to the right or too far to the left. Mm. Um, the, the overall intention of this edition which one might not find in other similar editions is that we try to enter Frank's world, we try to see the music through his eyes, how might he have played it, mm. performance practice, how might Franck have adapted his technique, he was a pianist, um, and then switched to the organ, which elements of piano technique did he bring over to the organ, which elements of piano te technique did he ditch. Mm. Note commune, for example, the binding of um, uh, the, the same note in two different parts. Um, did Franck use that in his organ works? He did when he accompanied Gregorian chant, for example, mm. we, we know that. The instruments as well, it's, it's important. Um, you asked me earlier on ab about the registration of Franck. How does one register um, on any organ? Well, it's like any piece really, you have to adapt. Um, one can't play the same registration on every instrument, cause every organ is different. Um, and the point of giving all of these specifications in volume one is to encourage people to sort of think outside the box a little bit. Use the registrations that Franck gives as a, as a starting point, and if something doesn't quite work, just try something else mm. based on the specifications that Franck knew. Well, that's really interesting, because mm. I was going to ask you actually yep. about um, registrations, because César Franck, um, you know, French organists are very specific about mm. their registrations. Yeah. Um, César Franck, I think, was particularly specific mm. in, the, in his editions uh, throughout an entire piece. He would be very specific around pedal couplers, you know, um, mm. resi on positive, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. Um, and yet he was registering the pieces as if someone was playing his uh, saint Clotilde organ. Mm. So, I, so I wonder, you know, um, if César Franck was playing uh, saint I mean, he wouldn't have known the organ uh, that we know in saint because it was completed after he died, but he did know saint mm. Um Presumably, he would have um, been a little bit more. Um, he would have added a bit more to the kitchen sink, as it were, 
if he was playing San Sulpice, mm. so the 32s, um, the 16s on the, the Resi perhaps, or would he? Yeah. Or would he have actually been quite... I think he would. If, um, if, you, if you take the one manuscript, uh, uh, the um, second version of the Fantasy in C, um, which Franck played at the inauguration of the San Sulpice organ in 1862, um, Franck does give some registration indications, but they're very vague, which is mm. really annoying actually, because we can't actually um, get, an, get us a sort of overall idea of what, which stops he might have used um, on, on that organ. Franck played um, the organ in Saint Eustache twice. And is what sort of specification is that? Is, is that different to Saint Gothel? Well, so. Um, the Calanay organ, I believe, um, burnt down because I think Charles back from Barker was tuning it and somehow set fire to it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Quite so um, Du Croquet was um, Pierre Alexandre Du Croquet was uh, engaged to build a new organ, and Franck was one of the organists on this occasion, for which he did uh, compose um, one piece, possibly two more, which can be found in Volume Two of the edition. Um, but then he also played the organ again when it was rebuilt. Um, I believe it's after the, the revolution, 18, um, 1870 something, mm. can't remember from, from memory. Okay. Um, and the, Franck on this occasion played the Fantasy in A from the Trois Pièces. And Franck played it at the Trocadero, we know. Uh, he gave his registrations for the Trocadero organ in this manuscript, but also on two pages at the back, Franck writes alternative registrations for the organ at Saint Eustache, which are, you know, different. You know, they're not they're not complete; they're sketches, but they are different, and it gives us an idea of um, the stops he might have used. Mm. He used the Coroilophon, for example, which is a very um, funny stop. What's that? I can't remember actually. <laughs> no, I'm, not, I'm not sure I've ever heard of one. Yeah. Was it a reed or was that a, a, uh, a, a flutey a, sort of I thing? Think a reed, possibly. Right. Yes. So we've got a few questions uh, coming in. Um, one from Paul, mm -hmm. who just simply asks, um, "What is your favourite piece by Franck?" Oh, it's difficult. Um, <sighs> possibly. The B minor chorale, actually. Um, I'm not, I'm, it, when one plays the three chorales, it, it tends to be the one you're playing at the yeah. time. Um, but the, the B minor chorale, I think, is the most profound of the three. Um, if I was to pick a piece away from the three chorales, it would be the Prière, which I think is one of the. I'm learning that. The, the, um, <laughs> Possibly the greatest romantic oh, organ gosh, work, in my opinion. I find it quite hard to learn, actually. Uh, it's difficult. Yeah. It is hard. The triplets big, against... Big hands. Oh, yes. <laughs> so um, part of um, this year on BIS, we're, we're performing, recording, and live streaming all of the major organ works, of which you've done too. The Prière is, is mine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Good it's, it's, it's a new one for me. Another one from Paul, actually, is um, if César Franck was here now in the audience, or if you were able to give him a WhatsApp, what would you ask him? Um, <laughs> what would I ask him? Um, why do you make your organ works so difficult to play, I think, in terms of um, intervals, because um, some of the intervals are really quite big, mm. and his hands were very much like Rachmaninoff's. Which, do we have ev evidence for him having big hands, or is it just anecdotal? Yes, um, his, his, his students leave accounts of him um, having big hands. His, his um, students um, have left accounts of Franck actually rewriting parts in his pieces. And one of the things I'm really keen to do is try and get hold of one of these scores where Franck has rewritten the yeah. pieces for smaller hands. Because oh, right. I think that would be really fascinating. It would, wouldn't it? For us mere mortals. Yes, quite. Yeah. <laughs> Um, the best things in life don't come easy, though, I think. No. Nope. <laughs> um, we had a question here uh, from, where's it gone now? Um, from Marek, who asks, how long uh, did it take you to learn the Grand Pierre Symphony? Um, possibly on and off around a month and a half. Hmm. Um, 
it, there, are, there are some moments in, in the piece that are tricky. The, the last few sections, for example, and, and the, the pedal, the pedal solo. Um, and I hate playing in sharp keys, I really do. Yeah. <laughs> it's a real nightmare, all these double sharps. Um, I must say, you made it look very easy. Oh, well, very that's very easy. kind. Um, very, very relaxed um, technique and just, you're very comfortable at console. Oh, thank you. Mm. Um, so I, th I think the real difficulties came from interpretation, actually, yeah. how to interpret mm. it. Um, yeah. But a lot, a lot of the notes themselves aren't, aren't particularly challenging. So a question from Bill. And I hope there's a word here or a name that I might not pronounce right. I'm notorious for getting uh, pronunciations entirely wrong. Bill says, or Bill asks, um, does the do the manuscripts uh, that you examined accommodate the differences between the? Um, you'll have to go have a look at this here. Please, uh, do the manuscripts examine the common differences between the language and the language? Okay, so um, no. So maybe you could paraphrase what he's asking there. There's so two words as I'm not, do, I'm not do, going to... do, do, do the manuscripts examine to accommodate differences between Saint Clotilde, where Franck was yep. organist, and, and the Trocadero, Trocadero, okay. where Grand Pièce Symphonique was premiered? So the Grand Pièce Symphonique was premiered in Saint Clotilde, but Franck did play it at the Trocadero. Um, okay. But the I think the three pieces that are, are important in order to answer your question are the Trois Pièces. Um, the Fontaine, the Pièce Héroïque, and the Cantabile, because um, all we have are, are the manuscripts that Franck used for the Trocadero performance, and we have the first editions, which have registrations that are tailored for Saint Clotilde very clearly. Um, but there are no extant that we know of engravers' copies, i.e., manuscripts that the engraver used to um, set the music for publication where Franck's registrations are written down. So all we have um, are, are, are these manuscripts from the Trocadero where Franck writes his registrations down and these first editions where they're just in print. Um, so um, th th there's no clear um, uh, evidence of Franck um, writing both in one manuscript, for example. I've had a question here um, from Varling Who's, who's asking about your education and who's taught you and what schools did you attend, but I suggest um, there is actually a very comprehensive biography on Richard's website. Um, his, his biography does read very well. He's a very, very experienced um, organist indeed. It, it, so it's richardbrazier.com? www.richardbrazier.com. There we go, very easy to remember. Question from, and this is probably going to be the last one. A uh, question from Ian Garden. Ian Garden's mm -hmm. a, a long-time supporter of the channel. He asks, um, piano technique versus organ technique. Um, as you examined the sources, did you see any manuscripts that really was unfitted to execution on the organ? And if so, did you provide an editor's solution or just leave it as it is and leave the performer to work it out? So, something I talk about in the text on performance practice is that Franck, Franck's organ music lends itself very well to the piano. And Franck did have a plyel pedalier, a, a pedal piano, a piano with pedals attached. Um, and these were all, all the rage <clears throat> during the 19th century. Um, so Franck would have surely um, drafted his works mm. at that, or a piano at the very least. Um, the very early works, I mean, volume two, so the very first work that Franck um, wrote in 1846, um, is is very sort of slapdash in its approach. It's a really good piece. Um, <laughs> Which one was that? Yeah, it's the Grand Cur that I played. Right, yeah. Later yeah. On. Um, <laughs> slapdash. Uh, it, it's, it's sort of Lefebvre Valley esque, but Franck doesn't quite know what he's doing yet. Um, um, so there are, there are sort of pianistic elements, there are sort of elements that Franck is just starting to explore mm. um, in terms of organ writing. Um, and then as the pieces grow and grow and grow, you start to see a more mature style of writing from Franck. Um, but I, I'd say you know, Franck's piano technique never left him. And e even in the three chorales, you can see uh, this sort of very romantic style of piano writing sort of just trying to shine through, mm. despite mm. the fact they're played on the organ. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah. so he was a good pianist? Is he known to have been a yes, good pianist? Yes, he, he was known for... Um, playing far too fast. 
um, in his youth, and he was always being reprimanded. Um, and a, a topic we won't talk about today is tempo. Um, Frank did leave some metronome markings, and they're all rather fast. <laughs> um, but we won't talk about that. It's good to see now. that uh, nothing changes, is it? With no, today's no, no. youth still no, doing, no. Too, uh, doing things far too quickly. Well, I think we should leave the questions there today. Thank you. Um, I think it's about time. You know, we called it a night. So, thank you very much for um, for the recital. You're very welcome. Really, thank really you. Wonderful. Uh, thank you for chatting. Mm -hmm. um, I really hope you've enjoyed the experience. Yes, it's been wonderful, and thank you all for joining us this evening. If you have uh, enjoyed tonight's concert, please do uh, consider supporting these recitals. You can leave a donation in the super chat, um, or you can leave a, don a donation via PayPal. Um, I'll put the links on the screen in a few seconds' time. So until tomorrow night, where I'm going to be playing a live um, virtual church, especially for Advent, with readings, uh, antiphons, choral music, organ music, hymns, and a big announcement as well. Um, I will say, I think we should both say a cheerio. Cheerio. Cheerio everyone, take care. Bye bye. Stay safe.